Good afternoon. You're on Likeable Science here. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, Think Tech Hawaii is pleased to put on Likeable Science each week to help people understand that science is not anything that's scary and foreign and isolated. Science is something that's fun and a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. Every day you do science. Every day you live and breathe science. And we're just here to, here to help make that clear to you. So today I have Dr. Jelena Maricic, if I've gotten that correct, yes. uh, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The, she's an associate professor in physics and astronomy. Yes. And um, her, her research interests, uh, people like this, some, some of them I don't even understand the words in the research interests. Oh. Le leptonic <laughs> CPV violation is listed as her. It sounds like a crime, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but she basically deals with sort of the, the, the weird end of physics of uh, particles and energies that are so-called dark, that we can't really see, things That's that right. don't interact with any of our real regular matter and therefore are essentially invisible. And that's why we sort of entitled today's show Seeing the Invisible, because how do you see stuff that you can't see? How do you taste stuff that is that's exactly not, right. not tasteable? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's interesting because there are all these particles. We are immersed in a soup of, of invisible particles. And it took scientists a long time mm -hmm. <laughs> to actually realize that they are there, right? right. Because they're you know, seeable. And we need to build very sophisticated, very fine detectors, actually, in order to detect them. So one can say, well, if they don't bother us and they're there, why do we want to know about them? Right. But we want to know about the world around, around us. We want to exactly. know about the universe about us. We want to know what makes large, like 95% of the universe right. we, we, <laughs> that's we, around us. Right, so. we're curious creatures. And yes, the, the modern uh, physics now tells us that something like, yes, they say 95% of the mass and energy in the universe is stuff that we are not aware of, that we are not perceiving in any way other than through some of these That's very right. sophisticated That's machines. That's right, now. and it's uh, and it's none of the things, not only that are around us, but none of the things that so far we've been capable to produce in these specialty, specialized accelerator machines. None of that stuff is what makes ninety, actually ninety six percent of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the visible, the beautiful uh -huh. stars are less than a percent. Uh -huh. Most of it, almost four percent, is actually the intergalactic gas, right. and there are neutrinos that are invisible, but all these other things that, that actually govern how the galaxies move, how the, the galactic clusters move, is the stuff we don't see. And it took people a long time to, with these fine hints, fine indirect hints, to, you know, to come to realization, guess what? All this stuff is none of the things we know. It's something else. Right, yeah. It's, it's, it seems very um, uh, counterintuitive, a whole, a whole bunch of this. <laughs> um, so, let me, let me just briefly step back, because I, I don't think I, I mm -hmm. told uh, the, uh, our viewers anything about your background, uh, but, but uh, uh, Yelena comes from uh, the uh, physics department from the University of Belgrade. Initially, you got a, 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 her undergraduate degree, Bachelor That's of Science correct. there, and did a research position there, and then did her master's and doctorate here at UH Manoa in physics, and worked uh, were, uh, I guess an assistant professor at Drexel for about six years there, right. and then came here in 2012. Yes. So that's super, and so sounds like you're doing great stuff. But so, I mean, yes, on some level, this this whole thing sort of sounds like a lot of hand waving, right? It sounds sounds like, well, come on, we can't. Well, see this that's stuff my goal today to <laughs> <laughs> to convince you that we are not hand waving. Right. right. <laughs> so, you have compelling reasons to search for it. Right. So so maybe let's start with just a sort of a, a maybe a definition or two. So we hear about this stuff that you say this dark matter. Mm -hmm. So tell us more. And there's dark energy too. You know, both those terms sort of confuse me, and uh, I think they confuse a lot of people. But tell, tell me a little bit more well, about Well, the why. secret is they actually confuse scientists, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Everyone's confused. <laughs> so we are actually in the a, in a, in a same place, all of us. Uh, why is it confusing? Because we don't have it around us. It's, it's not easy to study. And we basically, all we learn is by looking at the at motion of stars and galaxies and galactic clusters. and. Uh, looking mostly at the light and gravitational effects. And that's by looking that there is no light, but there are gravitational effects. What you learn is that it must be dark. <laughs> oh, okay. That's why it's called a dark matter. It doesn't produce light. Okay. It doesn't, as we call it, interact 
and interaction in, in its interaction it does not use light sure. and that's why we call it dark because there is no light signature and guess what all those antennas that work in radio that work in infrared you know you, you can have different colors of light different right. wavelengths of light none of them see dark matter right so, so dark that's why it's called dark do doesn't it doesn't absorb or reflect or bend light in any yes. sense it does bend light oh. beca because the gravitationally okay, okay. That's, that's the only thing it can do it, it, it can do is because of the uh, general theory of relativity remember if you have a you maybe you don't remember <laughs> but <laughs> I, well, I'll remind you <laughs> is that if you have very massive objects and if you have uh, light which are photons passing by they're going to be attracted right. just like massive objects and right. as they are attracted their trajectory will be bent right. so that's the only thing that uh, that's one of the of the key ways that we know that it's there right. is because of the bending of light. Right, but it's a very small effect because of photons are ver have very little mass right. and therefore they're very only very slightly affected yes. by gravity. Right. Yes. Yes. And a lot of these things that you say these neutrinos have a mass a millionth of that of the of the photon. Right. And well, right. until about 15 years ago, we actually claimed they have no mass. Right. So right. Even but even scientists were not aware that they're right, right. they're not massless. As, as, as my wife says, you damn scientists keep changing your minds all the time. <laughs> well, there's research. <laughs> right. Exactly. Certainty. Once we find right. out, everything will be out of job. Right. But that's go. not going to happen. <laughs> so, right, and this is this is actually an important distinction, right? If, if mm -hmm. they're not truly massless particles, but they are of some infinitesimal mass. That's correct. That makes a great deal of difference in, in sort of the structure yes. of the universe. Oh, absolutely. Because it's a very big place. That's so right. There's a lot of this stuff around. Yes. Yes. yes, there is a lot of that stuff around, and then there is this category of dark matter particles, and there was a long debate, are they neutrinos, or mm -hmm. they something else? But then, actually, looking at the, just the general structure of the universe, and the, we call it clumpiness, so basically how uniform it is, or how many like gaps or voids, and how many like massive clusters we have, we actually concluded that it cannot be just neutrinos. It has to be these completely new, completely exotic particles that are cold, that we call them cold, meaning they are moving really slowly. Mm -hmm. That's what in physics, when you're cold, you, right. you don't move close to the speed of light. Right. Right. <laughs> and we also concluded they must be very heavy right. because that's the only way you can explain all these effects on mass and the rotation of the stars in the, in the galaxies. Right, so, but that's, that's a very funny combination. If they're slow and they're heavy, you would think, well, they should be easily bumping into lots of stuff and interacting with lots of things. But yeah. they're also so-called weakly interacting, right? Yes, yes. And the key point is they don't have charge. Okay. So, so remember, uh, it, it turns out that everything that interacts, it has to do with charge. You know, our atoms, you know, what we are made of, it's mostly electromagnetic interaction. It's really the charge, the fact that the electrons have charge and the nucleus have charge. Uh, this is the most of the interactions go, and those interactions are very visible. They produce photons, which we can see. But if you don't have charge, like these is dark it? matter particles don't have, you have no way of using this very visible light-related interaction. Mm -hmm. And they just pass, just like the, I like to say, like the light passes through the window. Right, right. <laughs> Unobstructed. That's how these dark matter particles, in like huge amount of cases, like, you know, it's not even like millions and millions upon billions of cases. They'll just pass and nothing will happen. And occasionally, they will. There will be like, a, they'll bump into something and we say it's, it recalls. It's basically like, you can think of it like billiard balls. You know, from time to time, it, right. the, the interaction will happen. Right, so Why sometimes it happens when it doesn't? That's really a, right, so a, a question. So I think <laughs> we have a, a slide that's going to show us uh, the, the, the start yes. of this. So this is sort of the, the clumpiness that you were talking about, right? Uh, thi this is, yes, this is related to clumpiness. This right. is how we learn about clumpiness. And you, know, you, you see the pi. Right. The pi is the measured actually from that, that beautiful, colorful right. plot. That's our sky right. in so-called uh, first light that survived the Big Bang, okay. that survived to us, to our level. That, that is the light that is as young as uh, 380,000 years from the beginning of the universe. And remember, we are 14 billion right. years away. So this yeah. is a very right. young light. And then by, by looking at, uh, at the slight differences in that light, mm -hmm. you get, that, you get that, that graph. And that graph is actually what you use by looking at the size of the peaks and the distance between the peaks. We actually figure out how much of it is dark matter. 
how okay. much of it is dark energy and how much of it is, as you call it, baryonic mass. But this is basically the stuff around us. Right. So th this then gets back to what you were just saying about the, so these so-called WIMPs, these weakly interacting yes. massive yes. particles, are not like atoms in any sense. They're not constructed no. with a positive nucleus exactly. and a shell of exactly. electrons around them. That there are some they are completely new. I mean, right. that's actually... We, we don't know what the so structure is. <laughs> Someone can say, this is a very bold, you know, you just come out of blue of a new thing, and you say, no, it's nothing like we know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, physics has a history of being bold. For example, mm -hmm. Neutrino was predicting in the 1930s, just out of blue, Dirac said, you know, there will be this very light particle, and you experimentalists will have really tough time seeing it, and he offered the case of champagne. And 25 years later, they actually detected it. <laughs> okay, well there were, you know, there were like positrons that are opposite to electrons were also predicted. So we do actually have a Higgs was predicted, the famous Higgs, the, the God's part, they call it the God's particle, right. in CERN was also predicted and delivered like 30 years ago, later. So. You know, although we come up with these bold statements, we, we do deliver. <laughs> well, no, it's, it, it, and physics has been actually a very successful science in the sense yes. it has. Yes, it, yes. It's, it's delivered increasingly good models of what yes. the universe yes. is and that, it, that increasingly is, are accurate at predicting oh, very subtle effects. Although I, I can tell you that dark matter is really a new level of challenge because our standard model that we like to call that, that right. nicely unifies the forces, you know, the very comfortable how things work, right. work out, how they interact. WIMPs do not confront, confront, confirm with any of that. <laughs> so, right, right. Okay, so, so it's a new game. And I should tell, you know, because we don't know, WIMP is, we basically model the particle based on what we can see in cosm ob by observing the universe, mm -hmm. is WIMP basically fits the model. And that's how you, you construct particles. You say, these are the minimal characteristics. So it may have other characteristics, but mm -hmm. this is the minimum we have in order to, to fit to what we see in the sky, basically. Right, and so these are, as you, you made the analogy earlier, of, it's like light passing through glass, right? Yes. You occasionally will see little bits of it either reflecting back or being That's bent right. to the side, but yes. m the mass of it just passes right through without That's doing right. anything. So, yes. Which is good for us, otherwise right. it would be radiation and it would produce damage to our body. Right. <laughs> so we actually benefit from right. it. It just, it, it's, it's good for everybody else except us studying it. Right. <laughs> we would like it to interact more. But, but so these detectors then are faced sort of in the same kind of challenge in a sense that glass is in capturing photons it's mm -hmm. not they're not glass is not very good very good at capturing photons at all right most That's of right. Them, and our none of our detectors basically and we'll get into this in the, mm -hmm. the next segment about how we actually do this job how we how yes. we actually try to cap, capture these things yeah, right because other scientists have to believe us that we've right. actually detected it <laughs> I think we've got another slide now showing sort of the next the next step in, yeah so so in the next one uh, when they show it, uh, <laughs> will be this one. Yes. This is this was actually one of the first really big hints uh, why we started suspecting that there is a dark matter. So what you see, it's a graph, but it shouldn't be too scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh, too many numbers so, on it. That's right. Uh, so what you can see in the graph is that uh, there is this higher line, uh, and that is what we expect that the speed of the stars rotating in a galaxy should be. And you okay. see that the that uh, uh, so the, so the upper line. So if you look at the center, there's the galaxy, right? right. right. And that's where you have the the, mo the mass is most dense. There are right. most stars, and then the density of the stars uh, gets lower, space, right. decreases. That's right. And then you you see the lower line that right. says expected from visible disk. Right. So basically, you know, looking at the visible ma visible stars, they have a mass, right? We can calculate right. their mass roughly, and these the dashed line actually tells you is what we expect of the speed for the speeds of these stars right. rotating in a galaxy. Right. And you see that as you go further away and the, the density right. of mass uh, decreases, the speed should go down. Right. But if you look at the upper line, it is right. very distinctly different from the lower line, right. the speed actually goes up. Right. And we're going we're gonna to follow up on that when we come uh -huh. back, but we're going to have to jump out to a quick break right now. Mm -hmm. You're with us here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, Yelena Marichik is, right. uh, <laughs> is with me here. I was having trouble with that name. We have another and 30 minutes for you to practice. <laughs> there we go. And uh, she's a uh, physics professor from the UH Manoa Department of Physics and Astronomy. We're talking about seeing the invisible, and we'll be right back. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. 
you know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He, he asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's question. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the Internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world, and there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having this year. It is on April 6th. 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all-ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between, everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it, some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that, too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April, and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. And you're back here with uh, Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today on Likeable Science is Dr. Yelena Bertic, and from the UH uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy. We're talking about seeing the invisible. Uh, she studies dark matter, neutrinos, and, and other such exotic little beasts. Yeah. Only uh, um, invisible things. <laughs> <laughs> She's only interested in what she can't see. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so uh, we've been talking about this uh, uh, initially about sort of what these things are. And I'd like to move a little more here into starting to talk a little bit about how we actually see them. I think we have a, another slide now available, uh, which I think gets gets into this. this. This was very pretty when you showed me. Uh, when you yes, said this. so this is what you're looking at, besides looking pretty, it's actually a collision of two galaxies. Ah, okay. Uh, and what you observe there is uh, the, the colorful things uh, is actually X-ray images. So remember what X-rays are just a type of light. Right. Very high energy. They're very high energy. That's why we shy away from them, right, in everyday life. But uh, so basically, you know, pointing the X-ray telescope in that direction and uh, recording those images, mm -hmm. uh, you basically see how the the gas, you know, the collision of the of the intergalactic gas mm -hmm. of the two galaxies uh, is happening, and that's why the light is being produced. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, if you go to the next slide. There is more to this picture. And this other part is we can also look at the, at the gravitational centers, if you like, of okay. these two galaxies. Mm -hmm. How do we look at that? Well, it's actually that bending of light that I was talking to that right. about you, about right. the mass of the star. So basically, if you have a very massive object right. and there is a light source behind, and we are on this side, we are looking at, the, at, the, at that star. And we're going to see the star, but you know, if there is this massive object, this, this light will not go straight. It will actually, you know, the light, it goes like this, it will bend, right. and it will come to us. Right. And it will be like a cone of light. Exactly. And that's what the telescopes, uh, and that's what the telescopes do. They actually look and they see uh, little, like, circles little of arcs, light. Yes. Rims, as it were. And that's what call, we call it gravitational lensing. lensing right. Uh, and then if you look at those, you know, if you look at that light that, that was gravitationally lensed, right, uh, you get these contours. And what you look at the, at the centers of the two contours, what they show is actually uh, the centers of the mass of the two galaxies. And what do you see? You see that they are very different from the, the, the bright yellow spots right. where the intergalactic gas is. Okay. And what does it tell you? It tells you that the most of the galaxy mass already of the two galaxies that collided they already passed through each other oh, okay. and you know that basically this intergalactic gas interacting is just like a tail you know oh. already most of the mass has passed oh. but you don't see any light signature what oh. does it tell you 
that it's dark. Okay. <laughs> I see. You, so you basically said that the majority of the mass of the galaxy is not this intergalactic gas. It's not visible because it's not producing light. You only by gravity, mm. only by its centers of the of the mass of the two galaxies, you realize that you know that this is lagging behind, right? right and right. that the most of the mass just went through. Mm. And we call it collisionless, right? right? Because obviously there was no effect, there was no light. It just went through like this, and then interacting gas is still interacting and producing those X-rays that we can mm -hmm. observe. This is called the bullet cluster, okay. and it was, I think, it was thing that basically uh, a lot of people after that said, yes, there is dark matter, and there is this stuff that is not like ordinary matter. Because you know it went past through, right. there was no collision, there was no light produced, so it was neutral, and but there was a gravity effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because we could see that bending of light from okay. these from this massive, from this big big mass in the galaxies that we cannot observe in any other way. So that's why this was like a, <laughs> it was like a several years ago, but it was really a kind of a key moment where people say, right. "Wow, it's you know, you physicists are bold, but." <laughs> I mean, These things re really look right. exotic. Right. So does that mean actually, though, that, that the dark matter doesn't interact with other dark matter either? Just as it doesn't interact with... Uh, it, it does, but like I said, because it's this weak interaction, okay. it, it, it happens rarely. Okay, well, I think that's, that's one, the key point. Two yes. Masses were yes. Able to pass yes. Through you know, you would have to have much, much more density for it to happen. It mm -hmm. will interact from time to time, but, you know, you have to have them... Uh, come together at the right moment right. And, and sort of feel like interacting. <laughs> because seriously, the, the probabilities are really, really low. Right. That's right. why we have trouble finding them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, th I think we have another slide uh, coming up that, that's going to help hopefully clarify this a little further here. Yes. yes, so what you see here is the clump, we call it the clumpiness of the universe. So if you look at the, at the distribution, you know, the bright spots are the galaxy clusters and, and, you know, the very massive areas. And you see the gaps, like it looks like a web. It doesn't right. look like a very uniform area. And that's what made people understand that it can be neutrinos because neutrinos are moving at the speed of light. and it, if you know they wouldn't if the most of the invisible mass was up to neutrinos right. they wouldn't allow gravitational clumping of the matter the fact that we have these beautiful nice structures actually tells you that whatever is that the most of the mass of the universe must be cold and slow to allow for the clumpiness to happen to allow for gravitational uh, clusters to, gen to be generated. Because if it was neutrinos moving at the speed of light, that would be very sort of smooth. Exactly, out. Right. exactly. Okay. You're doing really okay. well <laughs> with one course in physics in your life. <laughs> <coughs> Behavioral biology is not, yeah, not really that kind of Yeah, it's close, it's close. <laughs> so, um, great. So then, so some, somehow, we, though, we are able to build these detectors that actually do see this, this, these things, at least occasionally. Right? Yes. And so what, what's sort of the basic principle? I mean, I know with, for instance, radiation shielding, you, you use very dense material typically mm -hmm. to, to stop gamma rays. Mm -hmm. Is there something analogous here? What, why, why do you use, or what do you use, and why do you use it to detect? Uh, uh, there are several things one can use, but uh, one type of detection that we build is uh, we actually use noble gases. Mm -hmm. And one can say, well, why would you use noble gases? They're expensive besides being, <laughs> being, being rare to find. And in particular, we use argon. There are groups that use xenon. And uh, what you're looking for is we expect these uh, wind particles to be heavy. Mm -hmm. They are heavy, basically like heavy elements, like lead. You know, okay. if, you, if you look at their mass that we are kind of expecting, they we expect them to be actually quite, quite heavy. And uh, just like, you know, when you are uh, colliding balls, if the balls have similar mass, then in the, in the collision, a lot of energy gets uh, transferred to the target. Okay. On the other hand, think about if you have like a tiny ball and you have a big ball, right? right. You, your dark matter is a big mm -hmm. ball, your, your target, you know, whatever you're using right. to detect is something really light, right. light element. It will just bounce back and it will not be able to get much of the energy of the wimp. Right. So you want them kind of more comparable masses so because so you see the wimp move. That's basically. right. That's okay. right. Okay. It's like you know, billiard ball hitting like a ping pong ball or hitting another billiard ball. Right. You actually get more energy transferred if you have something that's 
closer. The other reason is that uh, when you hit, for example, the argon atom, or if you hit uh, a xenon atom or a neon or no noble gases, uh, they, we call them, they get excited. They basically, argon atoms will combine, and then they will get in so-called in a higher energy state, and they will go to lower energy state, and they're going to produce a lot of photons. Okay. And that's something we can deal with. We can see photons. Okay. <laughs> so, and we have a, the very sensitive detectors that can literally see a single photon. Okay. Whereas uh, something heavier like lead, which you might think you might mm -hmm. use, but lead won't do anything even if a lead atom gets hit. Yes, and it's also lead is not very transparent to light. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, because we, right, you know, well, we, we want to right. have this, we want this, we call it a target, right? right? So it's basically a lot of the same material, of right. the same atom, but we really need it to be transparent, exactly. right? Because in lead, yes, interaction will happen, maybe some light is produced, but that light will be absorbed right there, right? right? So you want yep. something sort of like in water, but we right. don't use water, we use, uh, we use argon in our specific oh, case. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. and. But that's, that gives you all kinds of um, technological challenges, right, to building these detectors. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> Amazing, you know, keeping, right. because we basically liquid, uh, for example, we use liquid argon. And there is a good reason why we liquefy. In principle, we wouldn't have to liquefy it. But when you liquefy gas, you get much more, much, m many more atoms in the same volume right. as opposed to when it's in the gas right. phase. So that's a practical reason. The technological challenge is keeping it liquid because the temperature at which, for example, argon is liquid is about minus 300 Fahrenheit, right. 305 to be precise, and that's, okay. that's pretty cold. Right, so that has to do with sort of the, the states of matter in terms of solids, liquids, yes. gases, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. And, and so we, we, that's like a basic physics right. of right. the phase transitions. Okay, I think, I'm not sure if, if our next slide has to do with that or not, but uh, is, is this, this this one is actually uh, you know the just listing the properties of dark matter that we okay. figured out okay. uh, based on that bullet cluster mm -hmm. and uh, so you know this is how we modeled our VIMPs, our okay. victim interacting massive particles because we learned that they interact gravitationally right, right because they're bending light right. so we say okay we need a particle that will interact via gravity uh, we also said uh, it's neutral because right. it's not it doesn't have charge. It's not producing right. light because charge is actually related to light. Uh, and we also said it has to be cold mm -hmm. right. in order to allow the clumpiness of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be long lived because we believe it was produced at a at a time of the Big Bang okay. and it's still there today, okay. so it's not decaying. Right. And then we say, well, you know, it has to we call it a non baryonic, which means it's none of the things we know. Right. <laughs> That's, sort of that's, a, that's like a nice, <laughs> nice way of saying it's like we actually have no clue right, what is right. it. <laughs> so this is sort of why you say that the, even the physicists don't really understand this. Yes, stuff. yes. Okay. That's why when you originally asked me, can you please explain us what dark matter is? Like I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't even know that is when we look at the uh, standard atom, which is made up of the, 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 the subatomic uh -huh. particles and yes. the, the protons and neutrons and electrons, and mm -hmm. those themselves we even know are made up of still smaller bits, yeah, yeah, the yeah. quarks and all, but the we don't have any equivalent sense no, on, on no. these. No, at this point we have absolutely no, I mean, we hope. <laughs> but at this point, uh, we are at the level that we just want to detect them. And, right. and you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of like a stepwise process, right? You first want to detect them. Right. Once you detect them, you know how often are you able to detect them. So you build your next detector and you say, now I'm going to have a sizable number of interactions. And when I have the, the event repeat many times, then I can actually start assigning properties. You know, right. start learning about it. But right now, we are really at the baby level. Sure, sure, right. But eventually, you want to be able to look at things like where, oh, absolutely. where, where, where do they absolutely. come from? We want to know, uh, you know one which, day, right. I would hope we will know as much about it as we know, don't know about electron or a photon. So, uh -huh. okay. so okay. that's the hope, but not today. <laughs> so our, I think the next slide shows uh, this is uh, this is basically how you know based on based on looking at the galaxies and mm -hmm. galaxy clusters is uh, we and, and those speeds of the stars rotating mm -hmm. uh, this is how we we actually imagine we call it a dark matter matter ha halo uh, which tells you you know the bright yellow part is the actual galaxy and what we observe is that this dark matter 
is rather uniform uh -huh. based on how it affects the so speeds the, the of the stars, the there, blue. Right. Uh, and what you see that it extends much, much further than the galaxy itself. Okay. So this is basically the message. And you know, and I, I have colleagues who actually say, well, it's kind of naive, but it's based on the observation. You know, th it's the simplest model. It's like a spherical pig. That's the joke in physics. Mm -hmm. right, right. <laughs> when you do the first level approximation, you make everything spherical. Sure, right. But right now, we have no reason of making it more complicating. So that's why it's our beginning. And this, the, the, that little picture actually shows that uh, how our detectors are envisioned. That you know, we, we are immersed. Our, our solar system. It's everything is immersed in the dark matter halo, halo, and. Uh, as we move, our detectors also move through the through the weakly interactive right. massive particles, and from time to time they will interact and they will produce light, and that's how we want to observe them. Exactly, exactly. And we're going to talk more about this when we come back. Mm -hmm. but we're going to take a little break right now. Sure. You're here with us on Likeable Science. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Helena Maurice Merchich, and uh, from the UH Department of Physics and Astronomy. We're talking about seeing the invisible, uh, that is dark matter, dark energy, and, and other, other exotic things. We'll be right back. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, OK? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5. And we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. OK, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Yelena Maricic uh, yes. from the UH Department of Physics and Astronomy. We're talking about seeing the invisible, all that dark matter, neutrinos, and, and other particles that you can't really see uh, with your, your, the bare eye. You can't really see them with almost any standard devices that we have because yes. these are things that, that don't interact with normal matter. These are truly uh, very exotic kinds of stuff, if I, if I may use a technical scientific term, <laughs> uh, that, that's really made up completely differently than all the standard matter that yes. we know of. Yes. And um, so we, we were talking a little bit about sort of the, uh, at the start about the reasons why we should believe in this stuff, which sort, mm -hmm. of, sort of sounds like a big story. Mm -hmm. and we're talking a little more about the uh, detection, and we're going to sort of follow up on that, that detection business here. Um, and. So you, you said we're using you use containers of argon, basically. Yes, in our case, there are there are several ways you can do it, and uh, but one of the ways is basically using a bucket of argon okay. and liquid, cooling it down to minus three hundred five Fahrenheit so that it becomes liquid, uh, and then just hoping and waiting <laughs> <laughs> for the dark dark matter right. particle for right. them to bump into one of your argons and right. produce light. Right. So I think the first slide 
talks will show us a little bit. Of, so this is this is a wimp in theory. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, this is argon. Oh, this is argon. Okay. Yes, and the green. You see the little xi. So the green is actually just you know wimp passing by. Okay. And occasionally uh, interacting or basically colliding, and it's called. It's called recoil because okay. it basically bumps into your argon atom <coughs> and then moves away. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and we expect it to happen. That's why it's called low energy nuclear recoil because it's going to be a really, really tiny amount of energy. So we have to make a very sensitive detectors that can detect tiny, tiny, right. tiny depositions and of so the, that, energy. And uh, so that collision excites the argon atom a little bit, then as it Drops its energy back down. Yes. It's emitting a photon to do that, yes. and that's what you're detecting. Yeah. So you have a whole we're basically bunch of exploiting the fact that whenever something gets excited, it wants to go back to the minimum energy state. You know, that's what the nature is always right. striving for. It wants to minimize the energy, right. and how it gets rid of, of the excess energy is by emitting light, emitting right. photons. Right, photons. And that's our key. Right. So, uh, so yeah. So here, here's this detector, which is basically. Well, you can explain it, but it, it's yeah. essentially argon and fo and photo detectors. That's right. <laughs> so this one is uh, basically what it shows. The things, these photodetectors, are basically uh, electronic devices that can see a single photon of light. Mm -hmm. So when the when the when the wimp actually interacts with argon, uh, the light will get produced, and these photons will just move around. And we have these photodetectors mm -hmm. that are on all the time, mm -hmm. and if they they see the light, they actually produce tiny currents, mm -hmm. and we. Uh, record those currents, and based on the amount of current that we get, we can, we can ac actually track it back and say, well, this is the amount of interaction that happened. Okay, and, and you can sort of, because you've got arrays of these in three dimensions. That's right, we you, can you localize can, them. You, you, can, you can figure out where, where this exactly, happened. Exactly, exactly. When, when and that it's very important for us actually to find the locations, uh, because guess what? Other things can produce light too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and those are our enemies. <laughs> that's right. and you know to know your enemy very well. <laughs> that's right. You, you were talking about that, that its background is that's sort of right. the killer of all these experiments, yes. right? You have yes. random fluctuations. That, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so say, say a little more about, about, about this background. Why, why is this so, so devastating? What do, you, what do you do to try to combat it? Uh, well, what, we try many things. First thing we try, so what you s just see the slide is here. This is basically what happened. You know, this is your dark matter particle. Uh, it's bumping into argon, in argon atom in this case, and as a result, you get light. And then you have photodetectors that we call photomultipliers uh, because the, the photons will just travel isotropically, and we can detect them with our mm -hmm. photodetectors. But like I said, they are not the only one. Right. <laughs> uh, in addition to them, there are other things. There is natural radioactivity, cosmic rays mm -hmm. that actually penetrate uh, and they go through our detector. And all of these things will also produce light. Okay. And you know, so you have to very well understand how different types of particles produce different patterns of light. And that's our key feature. because. Okay. Uh, the amount of light and also the, the, the time profile of the light, like mm -hmm. is it the light that's all happen, happens in a few nanoseconds or is it the light that, that you know, uh, is, ex is emitted over the order of a, of a microsecond? It's a big, you know, it's like sure. thousand times longer. Right. This is actually our most powerful way of saying, well, this may be a dark matter. Or this may be just some gamma ray, some photon, mm -hmm. or some electron, or you know something very ordinary that, that is there. So the key feature is actually understanding your enemy, understanding mm -hmm. the backgrounds. Right, because if you subtract all that background away and you have something left over. That's right. Well, we also, what we try is we use a lot of shielding. Right. We, we try to, first of all, we use very clean materials. Mm -hmm. what, what does a clean material? The material that has unbelievably low levels of natural radioactivity coming from uranium and thorium. You know, we have uranium and thorium. Everybody has it. But right. you know, it's like part per billion is what we have in our body, like right. really low levels. And then we try to select materials that are still like that, that by, by nature will have very, very low levels of radioactivity. Mm -hmm. So you'll have very few accidental right. events, accidental background events. Right. And the other thing that we use is this, uh, is the mountain. 
mountain is our greatest shield against cosmic rays. We literally use it as an umbrella. Right. Because these detectors would never be able to work on the surface. Right. Because on the surface, they would be just bombarded. swamped. Right. Yes, they would be absolutely swamped. And, you know, our electronics would be dead all of the time, you know, mm -hmm. just detecting backgrounds. We would never have a lifetime. Right. So what we do, we go underground. And what you see, see there is an undergraduate laboratory in Italy. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Gran Sasso Undergraduate Lab. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about uh, 1.7 kilometers underground. Uh, and once we are underground, we get shielding from the cosmic rays, but that's not all. Right. So what, you, what you've seen in that picture that was just there uh, is actually the, the, the onion, I like to call it an onion structure of a detector, because you notice that there is this big cylinder, mm -hmm. and that's a big water tank. Okay. So what does it do? Well, guess what? Some of the cosmic rays they actually can pass through the mountain and reach our detector. Mm -hmm. And we use that water tank to slow them down and detect them. And if we see events in a, in a water tank, we know, you know, we cannot trust these. these. These are just ordinary cosmic rays. So we don't use that data. We know that's the background. And then we have that, that big ball. If you, can, if you can see the picture again, the, the pink ball, that's the one. Uh, that's actually full of oil. That's another level of our protection. So we have like a multiple protection oh. levels. And what you see on the left is actually how that sphere looks on the outside. This sphere, believe it or not, is four meters in diameter. That's mm -hmm. a huge sphere. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it looked pretty neat once it was detected. Uh, and all we do is we actually put a detector in the center and we co hope that all of these levels will actually reduce the amount of particles that can come from the outside. They'll mm -hmm. be stopped by all of these layers. Right. And, well, you can say they'll stop WIMPs. Well, not really, because remember, WIMPs almost right. never interact. So for WIMPs, just like for neutrinos, it's, you know, that shielding is nothing. That shielding only affects particles that have charge, right. which are our ordinary particles. Right. Intriguing. So, uh, and then then inside that inner thing inside the sphere is your actual detector. That's that? right. right, that's right. Inside that central part uh, is actually a double vessel because okay. it's, a, it's a cryostat. Okay. We need to keep it cool. cool. Right. So there is like a metal vessel and then there is just a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And then there is our argon field detector. Okay. And it's protective. And basically, okay. when we how we find interest, so this is the picture of the, of the detector just mm -hmm. going inside the big sphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's inside the, actually the water tank being lowered down the, into, the, in the, into the metal jacket that right. we call a cryostat, getting ready to be deployed in the detector. Yeah. And you notice that they're all dressed like they're in the hospital. Right. <laughs> clean, and clean it room, has right. to be a clean room right. because so of that, because we are, you know, dust actually has radioactivity in it that right. we don't care in everyday life. But right. for us, it's a big enemy. It can produce fake signals. Because right. remember, we, you know, even one signal can be like a discovery, right. but only if you know your backgrounds well. Right. So indeed, your, your clean rooms, they are actually much cleaner than hospital clean rooms. Exactly. Oh, they're yeah. much cleaner, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. So you keep it really, really, uh, really ramped up to, to the max. Yes, yes. We also, you know, our clean rooms are actually, uh, we filter radon gas because mm -hmm. radon gas is radioactive and normally people don't care so much, but we actually have special filters so that there is no radon gas right. in our clean it. rooms. Yeah. All right, so that's amazing. So this, this is intriguing stuff. So stepping back from this for a moment though, mm -hmm. what, what, is this, what does this and your work here tell you about sort of today's students? What, what should they be looking at doing if they, if they want to play this game with you, you know, tomorrow, if, if, if they want if they want to explore these same areas? <laughs> well, they, they really have to be very good at math and physics. Uh -huh. that's, okay. that's really the key point. And uh, they have to start early. And as I, as I always tell all the parents and all the, whenever I get in contact with anyone in middle or high school, I say, if you are at all inclined to engineering or science, Please take physics in high school. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I do tell that with some authority since I teach undergraduate level physics right. and I like my students a lot, but, and I'm sad when I see them suffer and the reason they, they struggle with the course is because they never seen it before. Exactly. So it's, it's important that there is enough science and math preparation before getting to college. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this has been great. I very much appreciate you coming here. You, you, you've taught me a whole bunch, and I, oh, I, I hope, hope so. <laughs> I hope our viewers have learned things too. It, it's uh, a very intriguing field. You've made it certainly much more accessible to.
to us. I uh, hope so. Uh, and that, that's, that's yes. what I try to do always on this show. And so yeah. uh, you've been... Yeah, you've I can also put a pitch that my students travel a lot. All of them been to Italy. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Some of them been to France there because well, the reason is that science. these detectors are very right. expensive. Right. So very Being so know. expensive, actually uh, groups from several countries usually chip in, right. buy so part of the equipment in order to build them. Right. And uh, so you meet a lot of people. You work in international teams. Sure. And uh, they get a great experience. Excellent. We're going to have to wrap it up here, but it's okay. been wonderful talking with you. Okay, Joanna. thank you for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. You've been with us on Likeable Science. We'll hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Excellent.